So I'm Kurt Thorne, director of the Nikon Imaging Center at UC San Francisco, and I'm going to be talking about optical sectioning and confocal microscopy and how we can use that to make three-dimensional images of biological samples. So our goal is to build three-dimensional images of biological samples using a microscope. And the example I'm showing here is an embryonic mouse lung. Uh, it's about 200 microns thick. And as you can see here in this animation, we've captured a three-dimensional image here where we can see the complete structure of this, this mouse lung in 3D and rotate it around and look inside it and see what's going on. And I'm going to talk now about how we do that. So in order to build a three-dimensional image, we first take a bunch of images at separate slices through the sample at different heights in the sample. And so on the left here is a panel showing um, 12 images taken at different heights through a yeast cell. And we have this set of two-dimensional images. And what we can do now is move through the different images, stacking them up into a three-dimensional stack, what we call a z-stack. And so I'm taking here the bottom image, then the next image, putting that on top, the image after that, putting that on top, and so on until we have a complete three-dimensional stack of these images. We can now take this in a computer and have the computer calculate what this structure would look like as viewed from different angles. And that's how we get these kind of movies. And I'm showing down here uh, a rotation around the axis of these two yeast cells here so that you can now, from this set of 2D images, appreciate their three-dimensional structure and layout. <clears throat> so how do we do this? We need a microscope where we can take images at different heights. So we have a, our sample here illustrated by this little cube. Um, we take a picture of it, and so we get a, a slice through the sample, which looks like this rectangle. We then step the focus. We physically move the sample up or down, down in this case. So we move the sample down away from the objective to get a second slice through a, a different portion of, of our little cube here. So we get a smaller rectangle. And we can keep doing this, um, getting slices through different parts of this object. And then we get, as I showed before, a stack of these images where we can now, in the computer, assemble these into a three-dimensional structure. And now we can look through that at different angles to generate a three-dimensional reconstruction of how this would look as viewed from different angles. <clears throat> Here's another example. This is a, a worm C. elegans expressing uh, two different sensory neurons labeled in green and red. And I'm showing here 85 Z slices moving through the full thickness of the head of this worm. And you can see there's a lot of information there, but it's, it's hard to interpret um, what the connectivity of these neurons is, what the sort of biological structure is, just from the, the Z slices alone. So when we render those in 3D now, we, we go and compute these views looking through different um, orientations of the sample so we get a rotation series, it's now much easier to appreciate what the geometry of these neurons is and what the structure looks like. So that hopefully motivates why we want to be able to do this kind of uh, three-dimensional reconstruction. So <clears throat> the challenge in doing this kind of work is that conventional microscopes, a conventional wide-field microscope, sees both the in-focus information, that is the information that's in focus at the z-slice we're looking at, as well as light that comes from above and below there, from other regions in the sample that aren't in focus. And so you can see in this conventional image here, this is a, an image just of a piece of mouse tissue. You can see that there's a lot of blurry, fuzzy, out-of-focus light here. In addition to these you know, sharp edges, there's, they're overlaid with this blurry, out-of-focus light, and that reduces our ability to see what's going on. If we use something called a confocal microscope, which blocks that out-of-focus light, you see that this image now gets much sharper and, and much crisper because we're only seeing the in-focus information. We're not seeing the light that came from out of focus. And so this is what I'm going to talk about for most of the rest of this talk is how one of these confocal microscopes works, how it rejects this out of focus light, and how it enables us to get these nice, crisp, in-focus slices, which we can then use to do three-dimensional reconstructions of objects. So if we consider how a conventional microscope works when illuminating a single point in our sample, we've got this blue excitation light coming in here. It's brought to a focus to a spot in our cyan sample. And that spot emits light. Um, that light is collected by the objective lens and focused to a corresponding point on our camera by the tube lens. So we see this green spot in our sample in focus. However, there is also light coming from other regions in the sample, such as these points out of focus and above our sample. And that light will be collected by the objective and the tube lens, but it doesn't come to a focus on the camera. It comes to a focus somewhere behind it. And so that will give rise to a disk of fuzzy out-of-focus light overlaying our in-focus image. 
So we see both the out-of-focus light from this spot here as well as the in-focus light from the spot we want to image. So that, the problem here is that fluorescence is emitted along the entire illuminated cone of this spot in our microscope, not just at the focus. So the trick in a confocal microscope is to physically block that out-of-focus light. And the way we do that is by replacing our camera here with a pinhole. And that pinhole is placed such that it exactly will pass the light that's in focus. Um, that light will come to a focus at that spot, make it through the pinhole, and reach the detector. So if we now draw the emitted light from that in-focus spot, you see it comes here and crosses at a focus exactly where the pinhole is placed, which means it will make it through that pinhole, reach the detector, and be recorded by our microscope. If we now consider the corresponding out-of-focus light, it will make this big fuzzy disk on the pinhole, which will block the majority of that light and prevent it from reaching the detector. So now we have, we've arranged our microscope such that we only see the in-focus information. The out-of-focus information never makes it to the detector. So this gives us a way of just recording the in-focus light. The problem now is we're only imaging a single spot. And to get an image, you need more than a single point. And the way we solve that problem is by recording lots of different points in our sample arrayed across it. And so the idea is if you have your sample here, you build up a, a grid of points you want to record, and then you march the laser spot, the focal spot, across the, the sample point by point, and then use that to record the intensity at each spot in the sample and reconstruct that image as a 2D grid of points. <clears throat> so to do this, we need a way to focus our light to a single spot so that we can detect the corresponding in-focus information coming from that spot. And to do that, we use a laser because it gives highly collimated illumination and also high power so that we can very quickly record this fluorescence from this spot. Since we need to record many, many spots to build up an image, we don't want to spend a long time looking at each one or it'll take us forever to get an image. So the idea is we bring in this, this collimated beam, and as you can see here, a collimated beam gives gives us a single focal point in the sample, and we can record that information. How do we move that spot, right? It doesn't do us any good to just image a single spot in our sample. We want to have this grid of spots. And so to do that, we can change the angle of illumination as it enters the objective. And so see here, if we come in with light that's coming perpendicular to the uh, plane of the objective here, it comes to a focus exactly in the center of the field of view. If we now tilt that beam so it's coming in at an angle, we move this focal spot off axis, and so we can now record from the left side of this object. If we instead change the angle to the other orientation, we now record a spot from the right side of the sample. So by changing the angle of illumination as it enters the objective, we can move the illumination spot across the sample. Uh, you might be wondering now how we still detect the, or how we still block the out of focus light, because now our, our spot will no longer necessarily be coincident with a pinhole. Right? Before we had the pinhole drawn exactly on the center of this optical axis of our microscope, and now as we move the focal spot off axis, how do we make sure that that light still reaches the pinhole and goes through it and doesn't get blocked by the pinhole? So here's the optical path of the confocal microscope that allows us to do this scanning. And the heart of it is this set of scanning mirrors here, which allow us to rotate the angle at which the laser beam enters the objective and thereby move the spot across the field of view, across our sample. So if you follow this here, we have a laser that enters our microscope. It's scanned by these scanning mirrors here. That changes its angle so that once it's focused by the objective, the spot it illuminates in our sample changes. Now if you imagine what's going on with the light that's emitted by that spot, it's going to come out, be collected by the objective, and it's going to come out at the same angle it entered, because the objective maps angles into position. And so the light that comes from that em emitted spot, that excited spot, is coming out at the same angle that the laser beam entered. And so if we don't move these mirrors, the, that emitted light will be reflected by these mirrors along exactly the same path that the laser came in along. And so that means that the light here is always coming in the same direction regardless of what spot it came from, because the scanning mirrors exactly undo the angle change that we apply to the illumination light. They exactly undo that angle change on the emitted light. So then all we need is a dichroic mirror, this 45-degree this, um, mirror here, which separates that emitted light from the laser. And now we can pass that through our pinhole again, and it'll reach the detector um, regardless of where it came from on the sample. So by using the same pair of scanning mirrors twice, once to scan the illuminated light and a second time to de-scan the emitted light, we can 
keep our pinhole fixed because the emitted light will always come back along the same path regardless of where it came from in the sample. So that makes this construction really simple. We just have a single fixed pinhole. We put a detector behind it. And now we can see the emitted light regardless of where it came from in the sample. <clears throat> so the detector required for a confocal microscope is, is a little bit different than a detector for an ordinary microscope where we can just use a camera. First off, we don't need a camera because we're only imaging a single spot at a time. We're just imaging the total amount of light that comes through the pinholes. So we don't need any ability to detect where it came from. But we want it to be very fast because, again, we have to scan the spot over the sample. And so if it takes us you know, a second to collect an image, it's going to take us hours to build up an image. So instead, we use a detector, a photomultiplier tube, principally because it's very fast. And so a photomultiplier tube can respond in nanoseconds to light impinging on it. Um, and so this allows us to collect a, a single pixel in our confocal image in only a few microseconds. I don't want to say a whole lot about photomultiplier tubes and how they work. Um, but I'll just briefly describe their operation. And so the idea is we have a light beam that enters the um, <clears throat> photomultiplier tube. And it hits an object called a photocathode, which converts it to electrons. And those electrons are then um, excited by a high voltage onto an electrode here. And they, they're moving fast enough that when they hit that electrode, they kick out additional electrons. Um, and by putting a series of these electrodes in our order here, we can multiply the signal um, by a very large amount. Most photomultiplier tubes have multiplications on the order of a million or 10 million. So that a single photon that enters the photomultiplier tube will give rise to, say, 10 million electrons at the anode here at the end of this multiplication chain, which will be very easy to detect. Um, so that means that these are, are sensitive to very low light levels. And they're very fast, so in a, in a few microseconds, we can record a bunch of photons from a single pixel in our sample and then use that to record the intensity there and then move on to the next pixel and repeat this process. So putting this all together, here's again our, our non-confocal image on the right, our confocal image on the left, and you can now see how this works. We've taken the out-of-focus light that's in the non-confocal version here and completely eliminated it by scanning the spot across the sample and all these pixels and only recording the light that's in focus and makes it through our pinhole. <clears throat> and again, putting this all together in a 3D context, if we take many of these images at different heights and then reconstruct them in the computer, we can get very beautiful images like this high magnification view of the mouse lung I showed you earlier, where we can now see individual cells. And so if you look at this, you can see the outlines of these individual cells here. The black areas in the center are the um, cytoplasm. We've only labeled the cell membranes here. Um, and so this is the real strength of confocal imaging, is getting high-resolution 3D images of thick biological samples. So what's it not so good at? So there's a couple drawbacks to, the, to a confocal microscope, as I've described it here, which is called a laser scanning confocal microscope, because we use a laser scanning across the sample to build up the image. The first is, as I've mentioned, we're building up this image point by point. And even though we have these fast PMTs, if you, have a, if you spend a microsecond at each pixel and you want to record a one megapixel image, that's still one second to record an image. So that means it's a slow microscope, generally. If you want to follow things that are happening very quickly, this is not a great way to do it. Secondly, it tends to not be incredibly light efficient. We, don't, we lose a lot of light in this process. And partly that's because the photomultiplier tube is a, not a fantastic detector for light sensitivity. It very, has very high gain, it's very fast, but it misses a lot of the photons that hit it. So it only records something like 25% of the photons that arrive there. Um, and if you put these two things together, that means if you're trying to go very fast and you have a not really high efficiency detector, it means you're not generally recording very many photons from each pixel. So for dim signals, this doesn't work very well. Um, and so the two big drawbacks of a laser scanning confocal microscope are that it's slow, and it's not really good for very low light, very dim sa samples. Fortunately, there, there's a solution to get around this, which is instead of using a single pinhole and a PMT, we use many pinholes and a camera. And this allows us to address both of these issues. There are a number of, of geometries you can use to do this. A number of companies have made different microscopes um, that use multiple pinholes and cameras to record images. But the most common one, and the one that's achieved probably the, the largest usage, is, is called the spinning disc confocal. And so that's the one I'll describe here. <clears throat> 
So what a spinning disk confocal does is instead of using a single pinhole to illuminate the sample, we put a disk that's punched with many pinholes in it. And they're arranged in a pattern that if we rotate this disk around its axis, those pinholes will sweep out across every point in our sample once and only once. Um, so that for every rotation of the disk, we'll illuminate every point in our sample once and only once. And so you can see here we've got these pinholes. They're placed exactly in the same focal plane as the laser scanning confocal microscope. But you can see now instead of illuminating a single spot in our specimen, we illuminate many spots in our specimen. And then because we're doing this, and this disk spins very fast such that it'll illuminate every point in our sample, say, in a, micro, or in a millisecond, we can then just record the emitted light onto a camera because we're now building up an image by sweeping these pinholes out across the sample rather than moving a single spot pixel by pixel. <clears throat> and otherwise, the optics are basically exactly the same. The pinholes, we use the same pinhole for excitation and emission. The disk spins fast, but it spins slow compared to the speed of light so that the emitted light makes it back through the same pinhole that excited it. Um, and then the only other thing we need to add is there's a, a technical refinement here, which is to put micro lenses, a matched set of micro lenses um, in front of these pinholes such that we can focus our laser beams tightly through the pinholes in the, in the spinning disk here to get um, high light efficiency delivered to the sample so that we can get most of our light reaching the sample. So this solves our slow problem because we're now looming of many pinholes. We can collect an image in milliseconds of the whole sample. And it also eliminates a lot of our um, poor light efficiency issues because we can now use a very high efficiency CCD like an electron multiplying CCD or a back thinned CCD to record the um, emitted light. And so we now record almost every photon that leaves our sample. This is what the pinholes look like. So this is just an image I took of our spinning disk where we stop the disk rotation so that the disk is parked and just shine light through it. And so you can see there, here's the pinhole grid of this little piece of the disk. Um, and it rotates such that these pinholes will sweep out over every point in the sample once and only once. Here's an example of a movie acquired with a spinning disk confocal. So this is a time-lapse movie of a dividing Drosophila S2 cell. Um, this is about 15 minutes uh, in compressed to you know, a few seconds here. So because they're fast and high light efficiency, spinning disks are very good for live samples. Here's a three-dimensional reconstruction of a yeast cell expressing a mitochondrially targeted RFP. These are actually the same yeast cells I showed at the very beginning of this talk. Um, so it does a good job doing 3D reconstructions as well. So what's its downside? So imagine here illuminating a single one of these pinholes in the spinning disk. In reality, they're all being illuminated, but let's just consider one. So you can see here in the center, I've marked this one pinhole here with a little green dot. That's the guy who's exciting. So now, if the sample is in focus, we'll create a little spot of green in our sample. It'll emit, and we'll collect that in-focus light back through that same pinhole. Now what happens if we start moving that, that sample out of focus? What's going to happen is that the disk of out-of-focus light is going to start to grow as it gets out of focus. And as it, the sample gets further and further out of focus, that disk of out-of-focus light gets bigger and bigger. And eventually, it'll be big enough that it's going to overlap with adjacent pinholes in the disk. And once that happens, we stop blocking that out-of-focus light completely because we're now picking it up through these neighboring pinholes. And so this is the main limitation of the spinning disk system, is that it has limited out-of-focus rejection. If your sample is far enough out of focus, that light will make it through adjacent pinholes, and that means that you're no longer blocking all the out of focus light. You can quantitate this, um, and so what I'm showing here is a plot of basically how much of the out of focus light is transmitted as a function of how far out of focus you are on the x-axis. And so in this red curve here, you can see the laser scanning confocal, where no matter how far out of focus you get, you continue to reject that light. It, you know, just you attenuate it more and more the further out of focus it is. The spinning disk here shown in blue for small amounts of out of focus, for small amounts of defocus, performs exactly the same as the laser scanning confocal. This is where that, that out of focus disk isn't big enough to reach the adjacent pinholes yet. However, once it does reach those adjacent pinholes, you can see here there's this plateau. And once we get to that plateau, basically we stop improving our out of focus rejection. And so what this means is that if your sample is really thick, the out-of-focus light from the, the far away parts 
are going to contribute significant background to your image that would normally be blocked by a laser scanning confocal. That's the difference between the spinning disk curve here and the laser scanning confocal. And so there's a, a crossover point here where the, for really thick samples, the, the laser scanning system will be better than the spinning disk. And that crossover is in the sort of 20 to 30 micron thick range. That depends a little bit on the, the spinning disk design and the objective you're using. Um, but for the commonly used 100x objective and the Yokogawa spinning disk system, it's around 20 or 30 microns. And so for thicker samples, you're not going to see as much benefit from the spinning disk as you would expect. It doesn't mean that you can't use it. It just means that it won't perform as well as you might like. So putting this all together, we can come up with some general guidelines as to when to use confocal microscopy. And I'm going to talk separately here about fixed samples and live samples because fixed samples are, are much less sensitive to the amount of light you put on them. For live cells, if you shine too much light on them, they die or you get photo damage to the cells, which prevents you from, from getting the data you want. So for fixed samples, um, we can first consider thin samples or, or where you're working at very low magnification, where the thickness of your sample is, is not very large compared to the focal volume of your microscope, the, the region that your microscope detects in focus. So if, if there's if essentially your whole sample is in focus, there's no out-of-focus light, and so confocal doesn't give you any advantages. You can just use ordinary, conventional, wide-field microscopy. However, once your samples start getting thick with respect to the, the in-focus volume your microscope can record, say if you're using a 100x objective with a you know, 700 nanometer focal volume and your sample's 10 microns thick, then you now have an advantage for doing confocal. And typically, for fixed specimens, you would use laser scanning confocal because the out-of-focus rejection is better um, than for a spinning disk system. The one exception maybe is if you're looking at very dim fixed samples where the, the higher light sensitivity of a spinning disk might be an advantage. As your samples get thicker, um, you know, sort of in the 30 to 50 micron range, the laser scanning confocal gets better and better because the, in this range, the spinning disk system stops rejecting as much out-of-focus light as the laser scanning system. So this is... Um, probably the preferred way to go. Um, and then as you get to even thicker specimens beyond 100 or 200 microns, even the laser scanning confocal starts to have problems dealing with the amount of out-of-focus light. And then you need to go to two-photon microscopy or other specialized techniques, which we'll cover in, a, in another lecture here. For live samples, um, it's a bit of a different story. For thin Again, for thin and low magnification samples where your, your sample is thin compared to the focal volume of your microscope, generally you'd use wide field systems here um, because the confocal, again, doesn't buy you any benefit. There may be some advantage to using the spinning disk because they seem to be more live cell friendly than wide field, um, but this depends a lot on the details of your instrumentation and it's hard to give general guidelines. If your samples, again, are you know, thin but thicker than the focal volume of your mi objective, so say, again, you know, your 10 micron cell and you're using a 100x objective with a 700 nanometer uh, focal volume, and you need to do Z stacks, you need to get slices through these guys, then spinning disk is really the microscope of choice. For thick specimens, it becomes a bit more of a toss-up here. So once you get to this range where the spinning disk is no longer rejecting as much out-of-focus light as the laser scanning system, it now starts to matter whether you really need the extra out-of-focus rejection or you need the more live cell friendliness and higher sensitivity of the spinning disk. And so it's hard to give general recommendations in this range because you may find that the better out of focus rejection and the laser scanning system is necessary to get crisp images. Or you may find that, that your sample is not really densely labeled. There's only small amounts of out of focus light. And so the, the higher sensitivity and better live cell friendliness of the spinning disk is an advantage. And again, when your samples get really thick, two-photon microscopy and other specialized techniques come into play, and none of these systems are really capable of handling it. <laughs>